Uh, Dr. Ajay Kumar, uh, Defense Secretary, Sri Ajit uh, Nimbalkar, representative of the Yashwant Rao Chavan Pratishthan. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you. It gives me great pleasure today to welcome Dr. Ajay Kumar, Defense Secretary, uh, for the 11th edition of the YB Chavan Memorial Lecture. I also take this opportunity to thank Mr. Ajit Nimbalkar and the Yashwant Rao Chavan Pratishthan for supporting the lecture series. Ideally, we would have liked to organize this event uh, in your physical presence, as we have done on the last 10 occasions. However, given the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic and the recent spurt in Delhi uh, in uh, the cases, we felt that an online interaction would be a better way to hold the event. And we were determined to hold the event uh, regardless of the circumstances. And this was the only way to do so. Dr. Ajay Kumar, our keynote speaker today, is a distinguished member of the Indian Administrative Service of the Kerala CADA. He was earlier the Secretary Defense Production uh, and even earlier additional secretary in the Department of Electronics and Information Technology, as well as DG National Informatics Center. He has a PhD in business administration from the Carlson School of Management, University of uh, Minnesota in the United States of America. Today, as the Defense Secretary of India, he is, uh, as you would all agree, in a position to bring all this rich experience together in dealing with the challenges encountered in formulating India's defense policy. We thank Dr. Kumar for sparing his valuable time today to deliver today's lecture. But before we commence, uh, with that, permit me to briefly provide a context for the event and the topic. You are well aware of the exceptional role played by Sri Vaibhi Chavan in shaping India's defense and security requirements during a critical phase of our history. Sri Chavan was India's defense minister during the 1965 Indo-Pak War and was directly instrumental in the establishment of the IDSA later that year on the 11th of November. 1965. This year marks the 55th anniversary of the founding of this institute. I would like to express my sincere and heart heartfelt condolences to the Pratishthan and the family of Sri R.D. Pradhan. It is most unfortunate that he passed away in July this year. Over the years, he unfailingly attended the YB Chavan Memorial Lecture held at our institute. Today, Dr. Ajay Kumar will be delivering the YB Chavan Memorial Lecture on India's defense policy, the challenges and the contours. As you all know, India's primary objective is to ensure its sovereignty and territorial integrity and to guarantee a peaceful and stable environment in which it can achieve rapid and inclusive economic growth and prosperity for all its people. Recently, the COVID-19 pandemic has posed new challenges. Economic growth worldwide has been dampened and the focus in India, like elsewhere, is now on restarting economic activity, even as we take measures to contain the pandemic. Naturally, there are budgetary stresses, and these are bound to impact uh, to some extent uh, on the modernization plan for our armed forces, especially capital acquisitions. However, uh, I believe that the defense and security of a nation cannot be compromised. India is a large country with growing interests around the world. The Indo-Pacific region has emerged as uh, an important strategic landscape for us. And we are no longer a bystander, but an active player on the global arena. We continue to grapple with traditional and non-traditional security threats and terrorism, especially cross-border terrorism, continues to pose a major challenge. With rapid advances in IT, cybersecurity and artificial intelligence, the focus has clearly shifted from just quantity to quality, both in regard to human resources as well as the weapons platforms. The government has attached, as you all know, the highest priority to defense policy and will do its utmost to ensure that the armed forces of India are equipped with the latest weapons, equipment and technologies in order to discharge their duties. This is especially relevant in light of the current challenge that India faces on its northern borders in eastern Ladakh. Policymakers have to prepare not just for the conventional and the predictable, but also for the unconventional and the unpredictable. 
And for far too long, India has relied on external sourcing of technology, equipment, and weapons to overcome these myriad challenges. Today, India is working to redress that imbalance through Make in India and Atmanirbhar Bharat. And there is no one, in my view, more closely associated with all these changes in recent years than Dr. Ajay Kumar. Before I request Dr. Ajay Kumar to deliver his keynote address, may I request Sri Ajit Nimbalkar, the representative of the YB Chavan Pratishthan, to say a few words. Sri Nimbalkar is a 1967 batch IAS officer, uh, and he's a former secretary himself, uh, a former secretary defense production, and uh, uh, also a former chief secretary of Maharashtra. Uh, I request all non-speakers to kindly mute their uh, microphones. And uh, after uh, Sri Nimbalkar finishes, uh, I will then request uh, Dr. Ajay Kumar to deliver this year's YB Chavan Memorial Lecture. We will, if time permits, take a few questions at the end, at the very end. But I must tell you that we have to finish um, by 11 a.m. since the Defense Secretary uh, has another meeting and he has informed us of this in advance. Uh, I now turn to Sri Ajit Nimbalkar and request him to say a few words. The floor is yours, Mr. Nimbalkar. Thank you, Ambassador Sujin Chinoy, Secretary of Defense, Ajay Kumar. I represent uh, the Vaibhichavan Pakistan. Okay? A few words about the person and the Pakistan. Vaibhichavan, born in uh, then 1914, rose from a very humble background. He studied in a small village in Satara district. On his own effort, graduated and turned to politics. As a young man, he was a freedom fighter, a patriot. He was jailed, and also his wife was jailed during the British days. But later on, he came to the legislature. He was a member of the legislature, the state legislature, from 1946 to 1962, 16 years. Then he was a member of the Lok Sabha for 22. If I if I may request you. Sorry to interrupt you. Sorry to interrupt you, Mr. Nimbalkar. Uh, it seems you have some bandwidth problems there. Mr. Nimbalkar, if I may interject here, uh, kindly turn off your video and continue to speak. Kindly switch off your video. You seem to have some bandwidth problems there. Kindly switch off your video and continue to speak. Thank you. In 1962, Jawaharlal Nehru called him to Delhi to take over as defense minister, and uh, his main contribution was to expand and reorganize the armed forces, modernize their equipment, and establish new production uh, equipment for defense. He played an important role. He was defense minister in 1965 during the Indo-Pak War. And in 1967, he took over as home minister. In fact, he occupied important posts in Delhi, of not only defense, home, but later on finance, and finally external affairs. From a young man with a village rural background, he rose to be the deputy prime minister of the country. He was an outstanding parliamentarian who played an important role in uh, debates and uh, seminars, etc. But his personal life was flawless. There was not a whiff of scandal in his life. He was devoted to his wife, Venutai, who during the British days was jailed and later on supported him throughout. He uh, at the end of his life, he was a lonely man. He was affected by a death and uh, passed away in 1984. And when, uh, after his death, when they found out 
his bank balance, he had only a few thousand rupees. Absolutely clean and uh, flawless career. It was not only the uh, political life, but even in his personal life, he was uh, an outstanding person. He was a voracious read reader. He read a lot of books and he was uh, devoted to literature, drama, music, etc. He attended these programs invariably at, in Maharashtra, particularly. He, uh, he died a little early. He was only 70 when he passed away. But after his death, we established Vaibhichavan Pratishtha, mainly to propagate his ideas to make the young generation familiar with his thinking. The Pratishtan uh, organizes several training programs, seminars on relevant subjects. It has instituted a scheme of awards, both at the state level and at the national level. And uh, it has established uh, centers all over the state to, to make the young generation aware of his thinking. Uh, Sri Aldi Pradhan, was a trustee of uh, the Vaibhichavan Pratishtan, played an important role in establishing this chair, the IDSA. He had attended programs for years. Unfortunately, he passed away in July, and uh, we miss him a lot, both at uh, the state level and at other functions. With these few words, I think I will stop here and let us wait for the main program to continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sri Nimbalkar, for your kind words and also for bringing uh, to us uh, the uh, high uh, standards, uh, high values uh, uh, of the life uh, of uh, Sri Vaibhi Chavan. Uh, and you obviously have immortalized him and his uh, life uh, through your activities, through the activities of the Pratishtan. Thank you very much. Uh, I now request uh, Dr. Ajay Kumar, Defence Secretary, to deliver this year's YB Chavan Memorial Lecture. The floor is yours. May I request you to unmute your mic, please? Uh, the mic is on mute. Uh, so we have not uh, been able to get the sound. Okay. Yes, please. Am yes, you, yeah. yes, you are, you are you are audible now. Yes, please. Please start. The floor is yours. Good, good morning, everyone. Uh, Shri Sujan Chennai, DG IDSA, Mr. Ajit Nimbalkar, and friends. Let me say at the outset, it's a privilege to be delivering the 11th edition of IDSA. YB Chavan Memorial Lecture this year. I would also like to pay my respects and condolences to Mr. Pradhan, who has left for his heavenly abode earlier this year. The topic on which I am going to speak is India's defense policy, contours and challenges. Let me start by saying that defense policy involves decisions in the context of A, the international security environment, and B, the domestic constraints and motivations. The contours of strategic decisions are therefore defined by the context of international policies, as well as the structural decisions which are governed by the domestic context. Strategic decisions deal with threats and challenges of the alliances, balance of power, nuclear weapons, transnational terrorism, war and peace. Structural decisions deal with issues like modernization of armed forces, procurement of weapons, within the overall ambit of resources available and other decision-making structures. These strategic and structural variables are not independent. 
and are mutually interactive. For instance, India's arms acquisition and our approaches for enhancing deterrence involve both strategic and structural constraints. That is, at the strategic level, our approach towards enhancing the credibility of deterrence through capability acquisition must take into account the structural constraints of physical resource availability. Friends, over the if years, the importance of defense policy in India's national security studies has increased a great deal. And this is also because of the continuity and multiplicity of external threats, both military and non-military. Threats and challenges from the emerging international security system have dictated better political and strategic management of defense. External and domestic environments in the context of India's defense policy making are not compute, uh, not competing but mutually interactive influences. A credible and an affordable defense will depend a great deal on our ability to craft resilient strategic approach within the overarching influence of both external and internal determinants. It is in this background that I will try to look at the Indian defense policy imperatives. Defense policy is a wide subject and encompasses all aspects like operations, human resource issues, including recruitment, training, acquisition, maintenance, financial planning, planning to take uh, for taking care of erstwhile soldiers, management of land and other assets, etc. The important task is to balance the budget so that there are monies for upgradation and modernization, infusion of new technology, new age weapons and platforms, as well as monies for taking care of men and women. This also touches upon the pension to the veterans and the correct ratio of short service and permanent components in our armed forces. Let me try to delve into some of the examples of policy domain in defense. To begin with, the policy perspective which has implications in the operational capabilities of our forces. The directives of the government act as general guiding principle to prepare for and fight a war. These directives have to be suitably calibrated as a new dimension that has emerged now where both response short of war and proxy war have now emerged very as ways of war. Second, it is now becoming imperative to bring in greater jointness and integration in our defense forces. A major reform process has been initiated with the formation of the first chief of defense staff in the country earlier this year and the formation of the Department of Military Affairs. Third, development of our border infrastructure is an important part of our operational capability. We are ramping up our border infrastructure with a twin objective of meeting the developmental needs of border areas as well as our strategic requirements. As regards human resources, there is no doubt that the need to preserve our territorial integrity against existing challenges and secure our larger strategic interests require, requires the maintaining, equipping, and sustaining of an optimum defense force. This leads us to the following questions. What is the optimum size of a defense force 
for a country like ours? What is the right force mix? What would be the appropriate command structure? These questions defy easy answers. It would, however, not be incorrect to say that the size and complement that met the requirement 10 or 20 years ago may not be what is needed for the present. Similarly, the way we are currently structured may not allow us to respond adequately to future challenges. Technology and improved connectivity and communication are great enablers and they are also great game changers. Any ex exercise to optimize the force structure has to be cognizant of these possibilities. And these are some of the issues that Ministry of Defense is currently trying to address. Another important issue relates to arming and modernizing of the forces. Arming and modernizing our forces involves determining the right capabilities and technologies that allow the services to deliver the operational directives. Here again, the need for greater and rigorous prioritization cannot be overemphasized, keeping the overall role and mandate of individual service. And as new dimensions of war are unfolding in the cyber, space, and information warfare, every country has to invest in hardware, software, and skilled manpower. These are rapidly changing areas, and hence, constant upgradation is required. Even in the conventional areas, new generation of submarines, ships, torpedoes, fighters, helicopters, tanks, artillery guns, missiles, unmanned aerial and undersea vehicles are getting developed. All these need to be inducted appropriately. In addition, maintenance of existing assets as well as new assets that are procured, stocking them to the optimum level, all these require suitable policy considerations. Closely related to equipping our armed forces is the related issue of self-reliance, art nirbharta in defense. A country with our scale of defense requirements cannot afford the dependencies that have been generated over the years and putting us in the league of biggest arms importer of the world. The answer lies in greater self-reliance. Atmanirbhar Bharat is the key foundation of our defense policy. India cannot emerge as a major defense player unless we create requisite self-reliance within the defense industry and emerge as a manufacturing hub. Indigenous production of our defense requirements, both for our own requirements as well as for export, has to be the vision for India. The defense and aerospace sector is over 300 billion opportunity, of which presently we contribute a small pie. India needs to increase its share in this sector. For India to be able to make its mark in the global stage of defense production ecosystem, we need to promote our private sector in defense and aerospace while increasing the efficiency and productivity of our public sector. In this context, it is very encouraging to recall the response that the last Defense Expo at Lucknow received and saw the largest number of delegates, not only from the world, but also the largest ever participation by the Indian industry. 
the government's decision to create defense corridors in uttar pradesh and tamil nadu also are step in this direction and will help achieving the vision the recent decision to increase fdi in defense up to 74% improvement in ease of doing business rankings and all other indicators also is our measures which will further enhance creating a defense production ecosystem in the country the recently announced negative list are is another step which government has taken to promote the def domestic defense production ecosystem the key to atmanirbharta or self reliance in defense is development design and development of technologies and equipment we cannot achieve self reliance merely through production based on transfer of technology in this task there is need to use all our national capabilities whether in the public sector or the private sector or academia or in the startups in the last few years we have seen significantly greater interest more than ever in the past in the indian defense public sector undertakings and the industry to design and develop defense equipment this has been evidenced from the several make to projects which industry has taken up without financial support from the government so motor proposals have for the first time enabled the industry to design and offer items to services which they have developed even if no specific request for offer has been made in this regard drdo has also started associating industry partners from the design stage itself as against using them as mere production partners under mission raksha gyan shakti indian defense public sector undertakings have filed over 1000 patents in the last 2 years startups are key to our overall r&d effort in defense after the launch of idex in april 2018 we have seen increasing appreciation of potential of startups in the defense domain today apart from idex drdo through its technology development fund services through their design bureaus defense public sector undertakings ofv all are working with startups in multiple design and development projects we are also trying to foster a closer relationship with academia in our efforts to promote the defense design production ecosystem we are also witnessing an increase in export of defense equipment and this is likely to enlarge further in the coming years it is noteworthy that the growth of defense export has been driven by private sector and for the first time this year india figured in cipri's list of defense exporters a key policy effort in this regard is to increase ease of doing business for defense several steps have been taken i do not wish to list them all however some main ones increasingly procurements are based on competition rather than nomination basis online clearances for export online clearances for various kind of nocs have helped greater transparency and faster clearances we are also working towards implementation of public financial management system pfms in defense which will bring in greater ease of payment systems several procedural steps have been taken 
under the recently promulgated Defense Acquisition Procedure 2020, which reduces the burden of testing and trials for indigenously produced items. Friends, let me come to one of the major constraints, that is how to improve the fiscal management in defense. Government has reiterated from time to time that funds will be made available for all essential requirements of defense and availability of resources will not be a constraint for planning and implementing defense policies. That said, the funds are not unlimited and there are competing demands on the kitty. This leads us to the issue of prioritizing expenditure, eliminating wastages, and optimally, optimally utilizing available resources. It is in this context that one again reiterates the importance of reforms that are required to carry out greater integration among forces which would reduce duplication and overlap of functions. To carry out these reforms, apart from the several new reform initiatives, the recommendations of Shikatkar Committee are under examination and implementation. I have already mentioned about the improvements that have been carried out under the Defense Acquisition Procedure, which reduce the burden and thereby reduce cycle time and make reduce cost, bring in cost efficiencies. Enhanced delegation of powers, financial powers, has been made to further reduce procurement timelines and associated costs. We are also encouraging outsourcing in non-core areas to reduce and optimize costs. Greater use of technology and greater digitalization is being carried out to improve overall efficiency and better, better utilization of resources. To deal with the international context, forging partnerships is a major area of priority in our defense policy. Let me say that our defense relationships are based on principle of free, open, inclusive and rule-based order, ensuring economic growth to meet the aspirations of 1.3 billion people of India and 2 billion people of the region. Emergence of India as, is a not a threat to anyone, but nor do we get threatened by anyone. Our maritime and national interests also require maintenance of stability in our immediate neighborhood as also preservation of a rule-based order in not just the Indian Ocean region, but the Indo-Pacific. The recent years have seen an increase in our engagement with like-minded nations and signing of some key agreements that will facilitate greater synergy and interoperability. The recently concluded Malabar exercise is one such example of our international collaboration and engagement. Defense training is another important area in our international partnerships. We are steadily looking to increase our footprint with respect to training, training slots that we offer to friendly foreign countries. In this direction, we have recently increased the seats on offer in the National Defense College for their prestigious higher defense management program from 100 to 120. And most of these increased seats will go to foreign participants. Let me conclude. Defense policy has acquired tremendous amount of importance in the current national and global scenario. We in the government are cognizant of the same 
and are trying to respond to the challenges. It is this recognition that has manifested in several new initiatives and reform processes which the government has started to take in the defense sector. However, this process is far from complete. In these times of fast-changing technologies and a dynamic world scenario, we need to continuously fine-tune our responses, literally on a real-time basis, and be ever alert to deal with emerging situations. And we are trying to do that. With the objective of getting the benefit of advice based on specialized knowledge and wide network, we have initiated a process of working with, th with, working with think tanks and research centers on a diverse range of defense policy issues. We are greatly encouraged by their response and the valuable inputs, and we look for, to continue with this process in our thinking in defense policy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ajay Kumar, for that very thought-provoking lecture, uh, the 11th uh, YB Chavan Memorial Lecture. You have uh, given us a lot of food for thought. And thank you for walking us through all the intricate details uh, of the issues that you cover in uh, the discharge of your own onerous duties, uh, particularly the, the interplay between the strategic and the structural variables, the balancing of the budget, the prioritization of arming our uh, defense forces, you have also given us much to think about in terms of the kind and nature of war that we face today, the proxy wars, the gray zone uh, challenges that we face, uh, issues pertaining to border infrastructure, jointness, uh, technology, improved connectivity, defense exports, the involvement of the private sector, and so much more. Uh, your plate is obviously full, uh, and um, uh, I know that uh, with your vast experience, you will be able to address all these uh, challenging issues uh, in the best interests of our nation. Uh, at this stage, I know we have you here with us for another uh, 25 odd minutes. Uh, uh, and uh, there are a number of questions. So let me uh, pose these questions to you. Um, uh, I begin with a question by Dr. Kalyan Raman from our institute. Um, he wishes to know uh, your views uh, about uh, how fast must we wake up to the fact that uh, India's adversaries are not going to be kind to us simply because we have fiscal constraints. Uh, and he cites the example of uh, China uh, on our uh, northern borders since April 2020. Uh, so is this a kind of wake up call to us? I know you emphasized in your talk uh, that uh, you know defense remains a priority and, and government, uh, as we all know, will do its utmost to make funds available. Uh, so that's the first question. And can we do this better by cutting out on wasteful subsidies? That's the point that Dr. Uh, Kalyan makes. Can we enhance defense capabilities by cutting out on some wasteful aspects of, of uh, defense expenditure, such as there may be? The second question, um, I, I'll probably give you three questions at a time, if you don't mind, and take maybe two sets, two rounds. The second question is by Dr. Sanjay Baru. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Baru, a distinguished fellow at our institute, uh, he asks, what have been the major impediments in the progress uh, in uh, the Make in India program in defense manufacturing, in your view? Um, the third question is by uh, Mr. Uh, Partap uh, Narwal, uh, and he is asking about uh, two separate services handling army uh, animals, um, the veterinary part, uh, presently, one breeding uh, and uh, carrying out treatment, another carrying out deployment. And he wants to know in the ongoing reorganization of defense structures, uh, would it not be prudent to make it a single point responsibility to have some economies of scale and efficiency? Uh, so these are the first three questions. Mm -hmm. The floor is yours. Yeah, so, yeah. So, you know, on the first question, uh, I would like to say that government has made it clear that resources will not be a constraint as far as our defense preparedness is concerned. Having said that, this does not mean that we have resources to fritter away. 
we need to use our resources optimally we need to prioritize our requirements and uh, we need to make sure that we are spending we we're getting value for money for every rupee that is spent just to you know uh, uh, also say that this is no uh, merely is not merely a statement this year as you know because of covid there have been budgetary constraints and many ministries have suffered uh, have been uh, you know inflict uh, given a budget cut because of the constraints budgetary resources constraint defense ministry has had no budgetary constraint this year and in fact we have been our requirements based uh, our uh, budgetary allocations based on requirements have been suitably enhanced and this is one uh, you know uh, uh, example of how our budgetary requirements are being addressed this is again not to say that everything that we ask for is received but this definitely reflects that government is very uh, uh, you know cognizant of the defense requirements being given the highest priority as regard mr sanjay baru's question on impediments uh, to make in india i think one of the important constraints has been our dependence on big public sector which have become monopolies over the years there is it is now time that we move from a world where only public sector is producing if we can afford to or if we can if we have no hesitation in buying from private sector in other countries there should be absolutely no hesitation in buying defense equipment from private sector in the country and this is a trend which has started uh, uh, for some years now and i think this is something which is going to yield much greater uh, dividend the second i think important aspect has been the lack of focus on development of technology we have focused largely on production by obtaining uh, technologies from some other foreign oems this had often led to uh, you know uh, while production capabilities need uh, are not to be undermined but our dependence has not gone and the a country from where technology is taken often imposes constraints in terms of how much of indigenization we can do how much of upgradation that we can do or how much of export we could do as a result we are able to produce limited numbers and thereafter we have to go back looking for fresh technologies the key remains that we need to develop technologies on our own and as we see greater dependence on software and it related uh, technologies in defense greater importance of artificial intelligence blockchain uh, communication network based technologies these are areas where we have huge strengths in the country and therefore it gives us hope that in coming years in fact in the defense acquisition procedure we have a separate chapter for ICT based technologies to be sourced from India which will enable that we would be able to leverage these technologies i would like to mention that even the foreign oems today are actually sourcing a lot of these technologies from india we have roughly about ex defense export of software and it related technologies in defense and aerospace sector a tune of about 1.5 to 2 billion dollars so while the leading co uh, companies of the world are sourcing from india i think we have to find a way by which we can actually also leverage these aspects third i think is the burden of trial and testing and we are now uh, the dap 2020 has addressed several things which will reduce the burden of trial and testing for indigenous products and this will help greater uh, production in the new areas uh, so i think these three things taken together will be able to significantly enhance make in india effort on uh, the, the issue of uh, you know the uh, vet veterinary core and uh, separate uh, service for breeding and deployment this subject has been dealt at, at in length by the shikarkar committee report 
and these recommendations are uh, uh, you know are uh, under uh, implementation some of these uh, things have already been implemented some of these things have been disbanded and i think today we are looking at a world where you know drones can do a lot of things which uh, you know earlier our uh, you know some of these beasts of burden were actually doing and we should we are progressively moving to see how we can modernize and upgrade some of these things so that we can move along with technology thank you very much uh, dr jay kumar for throwing light on all those important issues i'll now move into the second round uh, we want to make full use of uh, whatever time you spared for us uh, so the next uh, set of questions is from uh, commodore dr mani singh mamik is uh, the first query is about uh, uh, you know the fact that uh, whereas the defense budget uh, as a percentage of gdp is falling uh, the he believes that the budget for the uh, central armed uh, uh, paramilitary forces uh, capf is rising faster uh, secondly um, can it uh, uh, be the case in india that we institutionalize jointness through legislation such as the uh, goldwater nicholson act uh, as was done in the case of the united states of america to get uh, the whole structure right um, and the third part of his question is um under atmanirbhar uh, bharat uh, program uh, why are the consortiums of indian industry uh, formed to take on uh, strategic projects uh, as in the case of lnt and mazagaon docks for submarines uh, they, you know instead of having um, sort of foreign collaborators as tot um so i think this emphasis is on Uh, a greater domestic effort there um and also he wants to know about uh, one border one command i think referring to the itbp on our northern borders um so is that possible at all in your view um then there is uh, dr rk tyagi former chairman of uh, hal um he says uh, uh, i he understands that we need higher uh, capex uh, allocation any hope for that in the near future uh secondly um you already introduced the negative list uh, of imports in defense um your ministry has done that uh, as a next step indian industry in his view needs orders which are yet to come the lca is one such example uh, where price negotiations are going on for the last two and a half years uh and about 160 msmes are in waiting um and he also says that uh, now with the dap sp model and fdi in place what are the plans for defense acquisition therefore in the area of fighter aircraft and helicopters um can that be uh, improved much needed for the iaf and the indian navy how can we achieve make in india and self reliance in these areas um lastly if i may uh, mention one more from shri nalin kohli Uh, he believes that startups are financially weak entities whereas uh, government funds uh, development cost through uh, idex uh, program uh, can there be some part of revenue procurement earmark for startups because that would give them uh, a steady revenue stream to ensure their long term viability one more question from dr cherian samuel are you satisfied with the progress uh, uh, with the idex initiative or are further tweaks needed how many contracts have been signed so far under the initiative um may i uh, reel out a few more questions because this is probably uh, going to you know be the last uh, set of questions so if you don't mind i don't want to dissatisfy uh, all our uh, attendants today we have a very large number of attendees so mr amit kaushish who has worked for many years as you know uh, in the ministry of defense um he uh, asks how far has the dma been able to address the challenge of civil military relations and is there any possibility of a defense acquisition organization being set up as recommended by the mod appointed committee in 2016 um dr lakshman behra uh, who was still recently with us we have lost him now to jnu uh, he asks what steps uh, is the mod taking to control 
the manpower cost which has been growing exponentially over the last uh, several years. Um, well, um, role of private sector is another question people are asking. What, what do you see as to their future in defense? Dr. Ruchita Berry has asked that. I think I've covered everybody else. In case I miss someone, they will obviously have to forgive me because there is a cascade of questions here and I've tried to do justice to as many as possible. So in the remaining time that you have, um, and please do allow two minutes at the very end for our vote of thanks as well, but the floor is yours. Okay, so let me try. I think I've tried to take note of the questions and I hope I have them, but I may, if I missed something else, I, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so, uh, you know, Commodore um, Man Singh, uh, I think if I got the name correct, uh, you know, talked about defense budget falling as a percentage of GDP. I don't think that is correct. Uh, the, the, the question that often comes is that our share of GDP is, so it's not falling as a percentage of GDP if you look at India. It has been fluctuating and uh, it is not really falling per se. Uh, the question that comes is, whether how does it compare with some of the other countries that we are, uh, you know, with, who are spending more than us on the GDP? I think we have to recognize two, three things. It is one is that if we were to look at the percentage of budget expenditure vis-a-vis -vis GDP, it gives a picture which is slightly, in my opinion, distorted because if you look at India, the ratio of our tax revenue mobilization to the overall GDP is very poor. We, I mean, it is improving with a lot of digital uh, digitalization, etc. over the last couple of years, but still we are relatively, uh, you know, much, uh, you know, ratio of uh, uh, budget collection is far lesser. Therefore, it would be unfair to expect that you, today we are spending nearly 16, 17% of our budget on defense. And the, if you compare it with most of the countries, this compares very favorably and therefore it may be unfair to say that as a percentage of our overall budget resources we are getting less allocation but like i said earlier i think the more important thing is that government is meeting the requirements of a defense and top priority uh, the second question is uh, was regarding institutionalized institutionalization of jointness through an act as in some other countries well, you know, a major step, something which has been pending for last 20 years has been taken. The CDS has been formed, the Department of Military Affairs have been formed. They have set up separate, several task forces and study groups to come up with this very difficult task of bringing in jointness. And these recommendations will start to come uh, progressively. And as we come, we can decide on what what is the best way? We don't have to copy any country, but we don't. We can always learn from their example to the extent it meets our requirement. And therefore, based on the experiences of the countries, based on our own requirements, our own models of jointness will emerge. That is what we believe. The third question, I believe, is on the SP model, although I'm not very clear what the question is, but the whole idea is, let me, if the question is that why are we have if I, the way I have understood the question is that why are we having a foreign OEM giving technology in the SP model? So we are very clear, you know, and the, our defense acquisition procedure makes it very clear that the top priority goes to Indian vendors where we have the technology. SP model comes much later where there is no opportunity or chance of us having the technology within the country. In that situation, we are left with an option of having either to buy this product from outside or creating a mechanism by which an Indian industry, and traditionally what used to be the model was defense PSUs would get the technology and manufacture. Here we are looking to have Indian industry, whether it is PSUs or private industry, partner with a technology partner and produce in India. And with the opportunity and a big distinction is they will have rights to upgrade and further improve for next versions. Uh, you know, uh, as regards one border, one command, I think this is a question which is of operational interest. I think from a defense policy perspective, what is more important is to have the best 
possible way of managing our borders. And I think we would not, I would like to stop here as far as having one border, one command issue is concerned. Mr. Tyagi's question, and I will rush because of, uh, you know, um, I have a hard stop at 11 o'clock. Uh, uh, you know, on higher capex application, I must uh, say that this year, in the year 2021, we have 10% higher capital allocation over the last several years. This is one of the highest increases in capital allocation on any of the years, and we are also expecting higher in allocation in next year. On the issue of, and I'm rushing through in the interest of time, on the issue of uh, orders for uh, LCA with uh, HAL, I think uh, this is in final stages, and we hope that the uh, negotiations with HAL will conclude shortly. Negotiations are a two-way process, and we need to, uh, you know, get to a, a situation where we can finalize. And uh, this order, we hope to be able to issue much before then the previous order is exhausted. So there is no break in the production line of the industry as such. Uh, as far as the acquisition processes, there is a roadmap for uh, all of the, uh, you know, various helicopters, fighter jets, etc. We are also working parallelly on MCA and the. Uh, LCA 2.0, etc. So we have a roadmap for production as we go forward. Uh, Mr. Nelan Kohli's question on making, uh, you know, uh, uh, procuring from the startups and uh, from the, I, I must say that under the new DAP, all procurements for uh, uh, up to 100 crores have been reserved for uh, for MSMEs. And I may be, I, 100 crores is what my memory is, it may be 50 crores, I'm forgetting, but there's a certain amount for which the procurements have been earmarked and reserved, and startups are uh, welcome to participate in that reserve process. The question was asked whether I'm satisfied with the IDEX initiative. I think IDEX initiatives have, uh, are, have done wonderfully well. They have created a huge amount of interest, both in the defense sector and in the non-defense sector in the country and outside the world. We have got several requests from other countries to part to partner with our startups after the IDEX initiative. How many contracts have been signed? We have about 44 projects in which contracts have been signed and are going on. And the first procurement from IDEX initiative is likely to happen shortly. Mind you, the first challenge was done in August, September 2018, and the first work was allotted sometime in December 2018. And we are talking of about less than two years, about one and a three quarters of a year where the development of a technology has taken place at fraction of the cost normally which it would take to do this. So yes, uh, we are very satisfied. I would also like to mention ITEX has been able to catalyze a whole uh, environment of uh, working with the startups by all our organizations, whether it is DPSU, whether it is DRDO, whether it is services, everyone is today working with uh, with the startups. Uh, Mr. Kaushik's question on uh, DMA and civil military relationship. I think DMA and civil, we have a wonderful relationship between DMA and DOD, if that is one of the questions. Overall, uh, you know, the first uh, civil military relationship is an uh, you know, area where there are different perspectives which are brought together. And I think this whole uh, process of uh, you know, working in a civil related relationship is going on very comfortably, and uh, DMA has been playing its uh, you know con role in this regard in this relationship, good relationship that we have with the uh, between military and civil. On the defense acquisition organization, see, I think it's not important to have an organization. What is important is to do what it takes to improve uh, the acquisition process continuously, and. Again, in the interest of time, uh, I would not like to uh, enumerate all the steps that have been taken in this regard. DAP 2020 does talk of a lot of these steps and several other steps like setting up of a PMU, which will further empower the, uh, the defense acquisition process, increasing digitalization within the acquisition process, et cetera, et cetera, other steps that we are taking to enable this. Lastly, uh, uh, you know, uh, in fact, last two questions, Mr. Behra's question of what steps have been taken to control manpower. I think this is an exercise I mentioned, which is presently going on, and we are looking at various ways 
what should be the model, how much of optimization needs to be done, where can the cost be cut, how can technology be used, etc. And I think we should be having answers to these questions. We do recognize that the present manpower costs are increasing very fast and these need to be reined in. Lastly, on the role of private sector, which uh, Ms. Ruchita Berry has said, I think uh, there is, there is, it cannot be overemphasized. We are trying to promote the role of our private sector, and this is one of the thrust of our Art Nirbhar Bharat in defense campaign. Uh, apologies Th again for- no, Thank you very much. Uh, I'm getting calls for my next meeting. With yes, Anthony thank you. Project. Just 30 seconds, please. Thank you very much. You've been very generous with your time. Colonel Chagha, like an LMG, uh, you know, clip, please go through that burst very quickly. Uh, thank thanks you so much. Colonel Vivek Chadda, who I thank for arranging this uh, lecture also. Come on, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you so much to our distinguished speaker. I would also like to thank the Pratishthan for their support and especially Sri Nimbalkar and also our conference cell and the uh, the web team which has organized it. And uh, let's hope we meet uh, next year physically. Till then, uh, wish you all great health. Thank you so much. We come to the end of the meeting today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ajay Kumar. Thank you very much on behalf of the, all of us. Thank you.